Good evening. My name is Sam Childers. I'm the president of the Friends of the SMU Libraries, and I'm happy to be here tonight to help welcome Robert Green to the SMU campus. Um, first, I'm going to introduce the introducer, and um, then he's going to tell you a little bit about Robert, and we're going to turn the floor over to Robert. Um, if uh, just want to remind you folks, if, if everyone, if, if there are folks here that aren't members of the Friends of the SMU Libraries, we have membership materials out in the um, pre-function area, so please um, consider joining, uh, and we're happy to have you here tonight regardless. Um, Mr. Noman Nur Mohammed is Chief Executive Officer of Dynasty Hotel Group in Dallas. Following his graduation from the Conrad Hilton College of Hotel Management, I believe that's, is that at Rice, Noman? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he traveled to London uh, to attend the Institute of Is Ismali Muslim Studies. Since graduating from the two-year program, he has traveled extensively in the U.S. and abroad, speaking on a broad range of topics to audiences numbering in the thousands. He has served as a U.S. Youth Ambassador to India, where he took part in numerous roundtable discussions with the Prime Minister and Vice President of India. He was chosen to partake in a religious and spiritual dis discourse at the behest of the Dalai Lama at his home in India. Noman was recently appointed an American Marshall Fellow where he traveled to Europe as a guest of the European Union in order to meet with European leaders and government officials. Please welcome uh, Noman Mohammed. Seems like all lies to me. Niccolo Machiavelli, Sun Tzu. Friedrich Nietzsche, Robert Green. There are only a few individuals in history whose peers exist only in the graveyards. And his readers are not fans, they are disciples. Now, if you haven't read any of Robert Green's work, let it be known that you are forewarned. There is a scene in The Matrix where Keanu Reeves is approached to take either two pills, the red pill or the blue pill. The blue pill, if you take it, you go about your life and you are blinded from the truth. And if you take the red pill, you stay in wonderland and you see how far the rabbit hole goes. Taking the red pill is reading a Robert Greene book. Now, if you haven't read his work, let me give you a few tips, some advice. Take all the self-help, all the motivational books you have, and throw them in the garbage. You won't be needing them anymore. You will look at the world differently. You will look at your mother differently. You will look at your wife differently. There will be no situation that you cannot handle in the world. Now, there will be two parts of your life, your life before Robert Greene and your life after Robert Greene. Welcome to the new world, a world where there are not laws like speed limits, but laws like crush your enemy totally. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter and choose the right victim. His readers, worshipers, some people say, are the most powerful people in the world. Presidents, CEOs, boyfriends of Kim Kardashian, <laughs> foreign dictators, rap superstars, and even Highland Park housewives. They are all pulled by his magnetism. Now, he sits on the board of directors for American Apparel, which, if I was the CEO of Gap, would scare the living crap out of me. Whether Robert Greene taps into the deepest recesses of Napoleon Bonaparte's mind or rap superstar 50 Cent, he will dazzle you with secrets of the world that at first were only known by a few. His writings, The 48 Laws of Power, The Art of Seduction, The 33 Strategies of War, The 50th Law, are instant classics. And they are consulted like one would consult the Prince of Machiavelli or The Art of War of Sun Tzu. His new book identifies the principles of individuals who achieve mastery. Not only did he penetrate the minds 
of living masters like Santiago Calatrava, but it's as if he had a seance with Isaac Newton and Marcel Proust himself. Now, he attended UC Berkeley at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he got a degree in classical studies, but he's also a student of the human psyche, which helps living in Los Angeles. Now, I must warn you, he looks like a sweet, very friendly individual, but so did Vladimir Lenin. It is my pleasure and such a happy moment for me to present to you someone I'm very proud to call my friend. Please give a huge Texas welcome to Robert Greene. Wow, how can I follow on that? Law number one is never outshine the master, but I don't think I could outshine the master in this case. That was pretty good, Lamont. Um, God, thank you so much for coming, all of you. This is, this is my first time in Dallas, my first time in Texas. Um, so I'm really happy to be here, and I really want to thank SMU for allowing me to have this opportunity. I really, really want to thank Noman for, for setting this all up. He's the most powerful person in Dallas, as far as I know, next to Mark Cuban. So thank you, Noman, for doing all of this. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> now, there's this question that people have been asking uh, famous people and friends for, for hundreds of years now. And the question is as follows. <clears throat> if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only have one book that you could take with you or have with you, what book would that be? Now, some people answer the Bible, which is a great answer. You know, this would be very inspiring and give you a lot of support during probably a very difficult time. Other people who want something maybe a little more entertaining but still inspiring would say Moby Dick or War and Peace, War and Peace being very long, so you could, you know, draw it out for a while. Some people with a sense of humor would say Robinson Crusoe. Well, when they asked the writer, the famous uh, English writer, G.K. Chesterton, what book would you take if you were stranded on a desert island? He gave a much different answer. He said that he would take Thomas's Guide to Practical Shipbuilding. Okay? <laughs> now, I actually happen to be one of the few people who's actually seen Thomas's Guide to Practical Shipbuilding. It, it's uh, from the 19th century, late 19th century. I was in the British Museum. I went to the private collection. I actually saw it. And it's an amazing book. It's got incredible illustrations, beautifully. Uh, it, it's something you, you could spend hours reading. It happens to have a chapter in there that explains how you could build any seaworthy vessel from a few planks of wood, how you can construct it with virtually no tools, how you could make a mast and rigging from plant material, how you could launch this, this vessel, at what time of year to launch it, how to navigate using the stars and the North Star, uh, an amazing book. So imagine you were, had this predicament, which book could you take? If you had something like Tolstoy's War and Peace, it would certainly be more entertaining than Thomas's Guide to Practical Shipbuilding. But after you read it one time, two times, three times, you start to get sick of it. And as you on the island three years and four years, and you're getting more and more depressed and suicidal, you probably are going to stop reading it, and one night you're going to use it for firewood. Thomas's Guide, on the other hand, it might seem like a dull book. From the day one you're trapped on this, on this desert island, you're filled with this incredible confidence and hope. You no longer feel like you're trapped on this island. You know that if you use this chapter, you can, you can get yourself off the island. You can start building your own ship. It's going to take months, probably years. But as you're building this little vessel to get, escape from the island, you're, you're, create, you're learning a, a valuable skill, you're building confidence, you're feeling more and more excited about what's ahead. Then maybe you launch this vessel, then maybe you get to another island and, or to some port where now you could read all of the books you ever would want to read and then you could write a bestseller about your experiences and say, sell the movie rights, on and on and on. <clears throat> so to me, this is like the ultimate book. This isn't a book that you read for pleasure. In these circumstances, this book can literally transform your life, transform your circumstances, save you from the most miserable, despondent condition, and bring you back to civilization. 
So I, I naturally, I, I applaud the spirit of G.K. Chesterton's answer, his practical spirit. It's a practical spirit that informs all of my books. But I can go even further than that. I would say that my book, my new book, Mastery, is my attempt to write Thomas's guide for practical shipbuilding for the everyday world. It's a book that I don't want you to sit there and read for entertainment in some passive sort of sense. It is a book that I want you to use to literally transform your life, transform the circumstances of your life. And I make the case in the book that in fact, all of us, all of you, are stranded on a metaphorical desert island. And what I mean by that is, in the past, 40 years ago, men, mostly men, would have a job, like my father, where they would essentially work at one position for their whole life. My father worked for 40 years for Empire Chemical Company. Um, and in that time, you felt, not so long ago, you felt that the company that you work for was there to protect you. There was a loyalty that went in both directions. You felt that they, that they weren't gonna fire you for, for no reason at all. If for some reason you ran into trouble with your career, you had a sense that your, your family, your community, perhaps even the government could help you out. If you had a degree like in law, or you went to medical school, or you got an MBA, that was essentially a lifelong ticket to lucrative employment. Now, of course, here we are in the 21st century, and that world that my father knew is completely, completely wiped away by the tsunami of the 21st century. It is gone, it is a dream. None of us are gonna work for the same company in our lives for 40 years. The Empire Chemical Companies are, are dinosaurs. We're gonna work for three or four years at this company, at that place, whatever. There's no longer a sense of loyalty going both directions. We don't feel like that company, that place that we work for is necessarily gonna protect us from cradle to the grave. We no longer feel the security that if we got into trouble, we really could rely on our family or our community, and we certainly can't rely on the government at all. So in some sense, the only thing that we can really rely on is ourselves. We're thrown back on ourselves. We have to depend on our own resources. We are essentially stranded. And to take this, this metaphor even further, the world that we all know now is completely different in other ways. It used to be that a company would have four or five competitors uh, that, they, that they could identify and that were clear. Now, in this globalized environment, there are hundreds and thousands of competitors, hundreds of thousands of people competing for the sm same small pieces of power. Even more so, the, the um, <clears throat> businesses and the, the crafts that we practice, they're changing by the day, by the hour. It's very hard to keep on top of all the changes that are going on in our different businesses. I maintain it's, it's as if we're facing this vast, chaotic ocean before us. And to navigate this ocean is extremely difficult, and it's very easy in our careers to get lost, to lose a sense of where we're actually headed. Well, I designed mastery as a way <coughs> to help guide you in this, in this journey. I'm telling you in the book that you actually have the resources, the, the raw material to help you navigate this environment, to get to power and mastery and success and fulfillment. That there actually is a North Star, an inner kind of radar that all of you p possess that can help you navigate this new environment. They're there, but you're not aware of these resources and this inner radar. You're not exploiting them, you're not using them. Just like building a ship on an island, the getting to mastery is a step-by-step -step process, a journey. I take you through that journey. I show you 
that you need to go through what I call an ideal apprenticeship in which you accumulate skills and you learn how to learn. I show you how you need to identify a mentor and work with a mentor, how to develop social intelligence so you can pre protect yourself from, from the manipulative people in your environment. How you can, by staying with this process, how you can awaken that natural creative energy that I believe all people have, how you can push past the 10,000 hours to 20,000 hours to the point where you have what I call high level intuition and you have mastered your field as, just as much as an Einstein or a Steve Jobs. Now, the book is very long, it's very complicated, and I don't have a lot of time this evening. So I want to focus on what I said earlier about these resources that all of you possess, about this inner radar that you actually have. This is the first chapter of Mastery, what I call the life's task. It is by far the most important chapter, it is the most important principle in the book, and I maintain that if you don't understand this principle, it is actually very, very difficult to achieve any kind of success or long-term power or mastery in this world. So please pay attention. Now, when we look at our lives and our career path, it generally goes like this. We're born, I think we can all agree on that. We then enter an education system and then somewhere around high school, maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later, in the back of our minds, we become aware of the fact that we actually have to earn a living. And this is a very tough realization for some. Now, some people who find this, this realization a little too harsh um, and it fills them with anxiety, they choose what I would call a direct path. They gravitate towards something like law, or medicine, or go for an MBA, or some kind of obvious direct craft or skill where they feel they can make a lot of money quickly, something lucrative. Um, there might be some interest, I don't mean to deny that they might not genuinely be interested in medicine or law or business, but if these fields weren't so lucrative, they probably wouldn't choose it. One of the more overriding concerns in choosing a path like that is the money, and nobody would deny that. But many more of us in life choose what I call an indirect path. So we enter the university system, we figure out a major that we think corresponds more or less to something that we like, and then suddenly we're thrown out into the real world to fend for ourselves. And we have to choose a particular career path that might suit us. But we can't choose anything that we like, and so a lot of our choice depends on what's out there, where we live, who. Uh, the connections that we have, where we can get some money together, where we can find a position. And so we take that first step, that first important career step. And then what generally happens after three or four years, perhaps the job is no longer there or we're tired and bored and we, sort of, we have to make an adjustment in our career path and we choose something else, maybe something a little bit related, maybe something not really related. And then every three or four years, another adjustment, on and on and on. And if you were to lift yourself up and look at this career path over 10, 20, 30 years, you would see sort of this zigzagging motion where it goes uh, 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 uh. Where the person ended up like 30 years later has very little relationship to where they started. Even people who take the direct path in life, the same scenario. I, I knew, for instance, this lawyer that I met in Los Angeles. He went into law because he actually thought it was an interesting field and he, he intended to become uh, perhaps a, a, a criminal prosecutor, a DA, and, and then get into a career in politics. And for reasons he couldn't really help, mostly because of his wife, et cetera, he found himself moving to Los Angeles where he had to get a job as an entertainment lawyer and he ended up in entertainment law and here he was like babying actors with their egos and movie directors, something he had never intended and he was pretty unhappy and he was consulting me to help rescue him from that. And I find that scenario over and over and over again in my consulting business. People who are in their 40s and they say, I have no idea how I ended up where I am. I'm not unhappy. I'm not completely unsuccessful, but I never really intended to get in this career that I find myself in. It happened by some weird random chain of events. Now, if you, 
examine this way of, of people, of, us, of how we look at our lives, we can make a few generalizations. A lot of the choices that happen in this career path are from external reasons. Where is the money? Who do we know? Where do we live? What are other people doing? A lot of these choices and this career path that we take is somewhat passive. It seems to depend on a lot of chance and good luck and opportunities that suddenly appear. And finally, we can say that we never really look at our overall life, at the overall pattern of our life. Instead, we're thinking in terms of blocks of three years or four years, or not even that, maybe months, of I got to get through past this obstacle. I got to get this job, and I'll think about the future later. There's no overall arching sense of a purpose, of a goal to our lives. And I find this problematic. The human being, and I'd explain this in my book, we're very unique, very strange creatures. Animals are basically programmed. They're programmed to respond in a certain way to events in their environment. We humans have free will, a wonderful thing. We have consciousness. But with that free will and that consciousness comes a certain element of pain. That freedom can be very painful. Sometimes we don't know how to fill up our days. We don't know how to make a choice. What is it? Is this the right choice to take in this, in this particular career path? Could there be something better? There seems to be nothing really, truly guiding us and telling us how we must work our lives. This lack of purpose that many of us have, this lack of a, a sense of a goal, is even worse in, this, in, the, in the modern world where things are, are changing so quickly. And I think it's actually the source of a lot of secret frustration and a depression that a lot of people have. In the past, that 